So what we're going to read verses 10 through 32, and then I invite the kids to come up here, okay? These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpachet, two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpachet 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpachet lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpachet lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sheila had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Sheila lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber had lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Reu. And Peleg lived after he fought the Rio 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Rio had lived 32 years, he fathered Sirug. And Rio lived after he fought the Sirug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sirug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahar. And Sirug lived after he fought the Nahar 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahar had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son's Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Or of the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205, and Terah died in Haran. Amen. Can uh, the kids, children, can you come here, please? the way that he called you. 
Let's pray that the Lord would give us uh, opportunities to preach the gospel to others in the way that we are receiving it here, right? Right? Yeah. Let's pray. Well, Jack, can you? Yeah, one more time. Father, we are so thankful, Lord, to hear the word. We're thankful that you gave us the opportunity to hear about the gospel, to hear about the salvation of the Lord. Lord. I thank you for every family that brings each child here, Lord. I pray that the message of the gospel would be, Lord, inside their hearts, and no one can take them out. I pray that also, Lord, that you use them, Lord, to minister and to bless others for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Can you get one? Can you help us? I think it's gone now. I think it's the same, but you can have it. Thank you, sir. Oops. So, there is a, a children's movie called Inside Out, and the feelings of the person, it's one character, you know, joy, sadness, anger, and so on and so forth. It, it, it's, it's based in the memory of a girl, in, in her mind. So, the, the movie is trying to teach children how feelings work, and sometimes it's funny, and sometimes sadness leaves the, the hub there, and joy comes uh, after her. And they find an imaginary friend. His name is Bing Bong. There's even a song, right? Bing Bong, Bing Bong. If you watch, I have a lot of kids, so I would know. But Bing Bong is this animal made of cotton candy, has a trunk like an elephant, and Looks like a cat. It's a mixture. But his main goal is to help the little girl go through difficult situations in life. Go, and she created him in order to, to go through suffering. What I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that the, the scriptures, they are not this magical book that the, it's only trying to help us through difficult times. And actually, religion is just doing us a, a good thing because it helps, helps you know, with our souls in, in hard times. This is not what the Bible is about. We, we, we must understand, as we finish the first part of this uh, book of Genesis, that... Without Genesis 1 through 11, we, can, we don't have the Bible. It is the foundation for the whole scriptures. If you don't believe in the historicity of these first 11 chapters of the Bible, we have nothing else to base our faith on. Because God created everything, and man sinned against God. So, here, after the Tower of Babel, we have the descendants of Shem. Shem was in the ark with Noah. Shem was one of the sons that did not look at his father's nakedness. Remember that story in Genesis 9? It was him and Japheth. Shem is a, a picture of the people of God here, and Japheth, uh, the Bible says that he will dwell in Shem's tent. So, in spite, in spite of man's sins against God, and what we'll see here is that even after the flood, this cataclysmic, like this horrible event that killed everyone in planet Earth, after, even after that, people will go back and sin. Because ultimately, sin was not dealt with. 
It was in God's plan to do that. And the flood was part of that. But in spite of man's sin, this is what I want you to think about as we preach. In spite of man's sin, God, who is true to his word, he keeps his covenant with his people. And he calls sinners to be part of his own people. We start in Shem, and we will finish the text today in Abram. Not Abraham yet. We will finish in Abram. But we'll see the beauty of God working throughout this chaotic place of idolatry, of sin, because they want to sin against God. It's not that they slipped. Uh, It's not like that. So the first part of the text, it's the, the biggest uh, part, is, is verses 10 through 26. We'll call that, we're, we're going from Shen in the ark to Terah and his idols. From Shem in the ark to Terah and his idols. One mark of the book of Genesis is every time you, you read This is the generation of, it's an important uh, mark in the book of Genesis. It's showing that uh, the the, the generation of the creation with Genesis 2, the generation of Adam, and and so on and so forth. Um, And uh, this is important for us. But in verse 10, um, the the name of Arpachad, it seems to be, in the order of uh, the birth order. Um, In verse 14, we have the appearance of Eber. Eber is an important figure, uh, important patriarch for us. Uh, It's out of his name that we have the Hebrews, Eber and Hebrews. Um, And another important observation that we have from the text is that you can clearly see the age range diminishing. So in some of them, we even see that Shem lives in the time of Abram. What would that be like in that time? And we know that the age is diminishing also because of the climatic changes in the world after the flood. Remember when the the Lord opened the gates of heaven and let the waters come down, And then the waters came up in the flood. So there was a canopy of water, of vapor, around the the earth that protected from the UV uh, rays. So now they would age faster because we don't have that protection that we had in the creation. So um, this is the time that we see what Moses wrote in Psalm 70. Moses wrote like this. He said, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. This is the pattern now, is not to live 500 years. Actually, Eber is the last one who lived 400 years. And you see that diminishing. Um, In verse 22... Another important uh, figure, they're all important, of course, right? It's in the scriptures. But for the sake of time, I'm just highlighting a few of them. Nahor is Abraham, Abram's grandfather, but also his middle brother. Two different people there, okay? Verses 22, it shows Nahor as his, Abram's grandfather, but also Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Terah, however, uh, is Abram's father here. And this, this is showing the wickedness of people. How sinful they were. In that time, there are ten generations from Shen to Abram. But in that time, Terah is not worshiping the Lord. They are in Ur of the Chaldeans. This is a place where they worshipped the moon goddess. A place of 
worship of idols. And this is the, the place where Terah uh, raised his three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. In Joshua, in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 2, it says, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates. Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, and they served other gods. This is what Joshua mentions about them. They were serving other gods already. John, John Calvin, talking about the line of Shem, he says that it's, it's, it's not about the, it's not so much on account of the dignity and merits of the family of Shem. Because we see that in Genesis 9, that God chooses the people of Shem, and through Noah, he blesses the people of Shem. But we also see clearly in the scriptures that even that line of the chosen people, they are sinners. Sin is still in the world. So it's not about the dignity or merits of the family of Shem as on account of his own gracious adoption. So God chooses to adopt, adopt the people of Shem. A great part of the posterity of Shem apostatized from the true worship of God. They went astray. They went worshiping other gods. Well, the people of God went away, but weren't they the chosen people? And the chosen people were supposed to do what? To worship God. What's happening here? It shows that salvation for the, the elect, salvation for the elect, it's not something because they're elect and they're special in what they do. Salvation for the elect is by God's grace alone. He chooses a people and chooses to bless them. So um, once I heard um, a, a talk in a, a college, a college student asked a, a question to the, the speaker there. He said, you know, you, you're talking about God as a good person, but why, why then bad things happen to good people? Right? It's an honest question. Many in our, in our society, they have that question. Why good, bad things happen to good people? And the, the speaker in that evening, he did a, a really good job to present that the premise in this question is wrong. That we have to start by saying that there are no good people in the world. So... The question should be actually asked, why good things happen to bad people? That is the question we should be asking. But somehow we twist the question. You know, Noah and his children, they were witnesses of the flood. They saw they were in the ark when God was pouring his wrath upon the whole world. What should have they done after that? They should warn everyone that God is holy. That God is willing to receive worship. That God wants to His creation to worship His name. They were not inspiring people to, to see the holiness of God. And you remember that Noah spent... More than a hundred years preaching salvation to the whole generation. Nobody listened to him. So, even with the preaching of Shem, of Noah, they could not be restrained from sinning. So, even if Noah and Shem could not do that, what happens to us, right? What should we do with that? Because sometimes we get hopeless. Well, the world, it is what it is. I can't do anything. Actually, we can. 
we rely on the sovereignty of God, and we understand that salvation is by faith alone, through Christ alone, and God will use us to proclaim the good news of salvation. I, I always remember the story of the prophet Jonah when I speak about the sovereignty of God. In, in, in many uh, children's ministry, when we uh, talk about Jonah, we say that he disobeyed God and a fish, you know, swallowed him. That's the problem. So you should obey because if you don't obey God, a big fish will catch you. That's the point of Jonah, is it? No, that's not the point of Jonah. The point of Jonah is that God loved a people that Jonah hated. Jonah didn't want to go to preach the word in Nineveh because he hated that people. So God, by his mercy and love, he sent that fish to protect the prophet, to take care of the prophet, and also to lead him to the place that he was supposed to go. Because there is no sin or no sinner that will stop the covenant love of God of reaching his people. So God loved both Noah and the people in Nineveh so much that he sent that big fish, that he sent Noah there. And Noah's, Noah's preaching was not an expository preaching of six hours. He just said, repent. And the Lord used that to touch the heart of the people. So, Yes, there is sin. Yes, we are sinners. But we trust in God's sovereignty as we obey Him, preaching the gospel. As Jonah, we will say salvation belongs to the Lord. It belongs to God. This is the story of a merciful God. So here, in Genesis 11, we have Nahor, we have Terah. They do not worship God. But even so, that does not stop God from being merciful, from showing His covenant love to His people that He elected before the foundation of the world. God will fulfill His plan to send a Savior through that line. It had to be through Shem. So Nahor, Terah, they could try to go astray but God will bring them back. You know, it is from Seth. It is from Noah, from Shem, from Abraham, from Isaac, Jacob, David, that Jesus will come. And Jesus comes from that line. And Jesus fulfills every requirement of the law. He comes from, from them. And he's perfect. So yes, God is perfect. Transcendent. He's above the universe. He's bigger than the universe. But God is also imminent. He works in humanity. He works in history to fulfill His purposes for our good. For our good. It, he's always good. In, in Lamentations chapter 3, He says, 37, he says, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Everything that happens in the world is because of God. We are not in life, you know, we're not adrift in sea, lost, waiting. No, we are standing on a firm rock of salvation. We are Anchored in the promises of God. The second part of the text is from Terah to a barren woman. Verses 27 through 30. See, we, we've just finished one genealogy. That's Shem's. And... In the end of this one, we were introduced to Abram, 
he is the, the next major character in this narrative, right? Um, but note something that even if you have a, a ESV Bible, you will see that there's another title before verse 27. Terah's descendants, right? It separates. It's kind of a breaking the genealogy. Verse 26, although we see that Nahor is uh, Rebekah's grandfather. So Nahor is Abraham's brother, and he's Rebekah's grandfather. Rebekah marries to Isaac. We see in verse 27, we see another important character in the book of Genesis, who is Lot. Lot is the son of Haran, who dies. Um, and Lot follows Abram on his migrations. Um, first he follows Terah, and then he follows Abram. But what is interesting in the New Testament is that uh, Lot is called as the righteous Lot. When, uh, in verse 28, Haran died in the presence of his father, it means that while Terah was still alive, Haran died. He died in his own country, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And that place, Ur of the Chaldeans, is this south of Mesopotamia, where they worshipped other gods, as we read in Joshua 24. So Moses here doesn't, doesn't say that Terah and his sons, they were Semites. They were Shemites. No. It's, it, there is a separation here. It's implied that they were kind of away from the true people of God, right? It's a city of the Chaldeans is where they worship these gods, these idols. This is where Abram was raised. And also Sarai, yes, in Hebrew it means princess, but also Sarai in Arcadian it means queen, someone that was related to the moon goddess. So, how deep is Sarai into this paganism? Paganism. How deep is, is, is her upbringing there? Milka also means queen. But it seems that verses 30, Moses is not only telling that Abram did not have children. He wants us to know that Sarah was barren. He is bringing, uh, he, he's setting up the context for Abram's story. That through the glory of God, the people of God will come. It will give glory to God. Abram, you will be a great nation. And then God gives him what? A barren woman. How crazy is that? Well, God... You change your mind? What happened? Thank you. What happened? You change your mind? No. It is to show that the people of God can only birth through the miracles hand of God. It's only through this, this powerful, supernatural birth. This is uh, what the Lord is doing here what is the impact for a woman to be barren even today in that time it was a, a great problem they would be belittled they would be mocked because the worth of a woman in that time is that the capacity of having children even with the feminist ideas today we still have that But, as one commentator says, this was the way that God was pleased to humble his servant Abram. Through these trials, through these impossibilities, that he will see that the promise of God will only be happening through a miracle. I, when I look at this context of Abram, I look at the contrary uh, context, right? It's against him to fulfill the promises of God. 
And I remember of a, a little kid that grew up in a poor neighborhood, had nothing, uh, you know, all the, the, what is expected of this little kid is that their future would be in crimes or doing something bad. But God took that kid out and used him for his glory. There are, there are environments that we're in that's very difficult to live, uh, to, to come out of. Uh, it's funny that on the internet now we have uh, the coach, right? Oh, you're, you're not working hard enough. You should be working hard enough, says the coach who inherited $3 million to start, to start his business. It's easy, right? When you inherit $3 million, you start your own business, of course. It, the tendency is to thrive and to prosper. But tell that to a single mom working 10 hours a day with three kids in an apartment. Different context. And Abram's context, he had no option in that sense. Only a miracle would do it. Only a miracle would do it. But when it comes to our salvation, we must be reminded the nature of our faith. This is our story. We don't have a, a good environment to be saved. We don't come from a good house in terms of our salvation. We are all living corpses. We're all dead. This is where we come from. And Jesus, by His grace, He, he comes into history. We have the creation of the world. And in the beginning, God created everything. He created the heavens and the earth. And man chose to disobey God. But he promised that through the seed of the woman, someone would come that will kill sin and death. And Jesus comes and he gives us redemption. And we are part of that story. We are brought into that story. There is purpose for you and for me. We're not here by chance. We're not an accident. We're here because God wanted to show His love to you. Not because you deserve that. You cannot merit. You cannot deserve God's love. Beloved, we must look at this truth every day. It's not your holiness. It's not your devotion that made God look at you. It was grace. There is no penitence. There is no uh, religious habit that you can do to change your life that will grant you salvation. Salvation is by grace alone, through Christ alone. So, we come to God. We come to God with this in mind. We, we do like Paul in, in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Verse 5 says that He predestined us for adoption from himself, for Himself. As sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praises of His glorious grace. You know why you were saved? You know why you were chosen? Not because there's something special about you. No. It's because of God's grace. It's because of God's mercy. To give God the glory. To the praise of His glorious grace, with each which He has blessed us in the Beloved, in Jesus Christ, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us, making known to us the mystery of His will. We obtain inheritance in Christ. So, when we look at Abram's settings, 
and we don't see anything that favors him. And we look at our settings and we see salvation from God. We can only respond by glorifying his name. Third part of the text is now we go from Ur to settling in Haran. Verses 31 and 32. Look at verse 31. Terah took Abram, his son. Wait, Terah took him. What's happening here? Because God called Abram, right? To leave. God called Abram in Ur of the Chaldeans. But what's Moses doing here? And we know that Terah does that because the verb took, it seems to emphasize that it's, the, it's Terah who's taking them out of Ur. Look at, um, another commentator said that Moses will, will tell us in chapter 12, look at chapter 12, verse 4. The reason for this pilgrimage was that God had appeared to Abram. And he doesn't say that in chapter 11 because Moses is interested in giving the setting to get into Abram. So in, in Genesis 12, 14... It says, so Abram went as the Lord had told, me, told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. But Terah, in verse 31, chapter 11, Terah left Ur of the Chaldeans. How can that be? What's happening here? Is that a contradiction? Is the Bible wrong? No. We may uh, have more, um, more evidence when we look at the New Testament when Stephen is confronting the Pharisees in chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, Stephen says, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. So God appeared to Abraham before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go out of your land from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. So what happened in the beginning of Genesis 12 is not in Haran. It is in Ur of the Chaldeans. So it seems that Abram is used there to convince his father Terah to leave Ur of the Chaldeans. It's like this. Let me give you a picture. This is... Or of the Chaldeans, so they go all the way up to Haran, and then Canaan. In this part here in the middle is a desert. And what happens? Abram seems to come to his father. He seems to say something like this. They are living north of the Chaldeans, a place where they worship the moon goddess, a place of idolatry. So Abram, who, who grew up there, seems to go to his father and say, look, this God appeared to me. I don't know him, but he came to me and he said he was the God of our fathers, the God of Shem, the God of um, Noah, Arpachshad. He told me to go to a land that, go, that he was going to show me, that he would make a great nation of me and bless me and make my name great. So, Father, I must go. And Terah seems to to agree with Abram and brings everyone to go. That's what happens in Genesis 11, 31. And you see that Nahor doesn't believe in that. He doesn't go. Terah only takes Abram and Lot. Nahor stays. So when Abram asks, Abraham then asks his servants to find a wife for his son, his servant go to Nahor's. To find Rebecca. So Terah brings everyone who believed. But when they're there, what happens? They stay in Haran. They don't finish. And God didn't call Terah to finish. The, the, to obey that. God called Abram. But what happens? Two things happen in Haran. First, Abram got, he, he gets rich. And... Terah, his father, died. 
So it seems that Abram was only able to obey God fully when his father died. So that's why in Genesis 12, 4, now with the whole context, we have that. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, had told him in Ur of the Chaldeans, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Because verse 32 says that this is where Terah, his father, died. And with that, we end the gene genealogy of Genesis 11. It's a strange story of a people who worshipped other gods. But is it strange, though? Or is it like a, a prequel for what Israel was going to do? This morning, we just studied the book of 2 Kings, right? In the book of 2 Kings, we see that they are disobeying God's law again and again and again. They are even sacrificing children in disobedience to God. Is it my story? Is it your story? How did, act, how did God actually save Abram? How? By he revealing, revealing himself to Abram. Without that, Abram would never know the Lord. What is your situation today? What is my situation? Unless the Lord reveals himself to me and to you, you cannot be saved. We read about God's revelation in the Scripture. We hear the gospel of salvation. You cannot do anything to be saved. It's by God Himself revealing. And in the Old Testament, there were other ways that God used to speak. Maybe a loud voice and dreams. But Hebrews chapter 1, it says that now, in the old times, God would speak through the prophets and through many different ways. But now, He reveals Himself in Jesus Christ. We don't need a special revelation to understand and to open our eyes about Jesus. We have Jesus revealed Himself here. This is the Word of God that is sufficient and necessary for us. You don't need a special prophet to come and put a hand over your head and tell, your future will be this. I was blessed in Christ Jesus. I was called through adoption, through Jesus Christ. I am loved. I am chosen. I don't need anyone else. When I have the Lord Jesus Christ dying for my sins and calling me to repent. You don't need anything else. You need Jesus and Jesus alone. So God chose him. God chose Abram. God took him out of idolatry. He took him out of Ur of the Chaldeans to make him a great nation. God gave him a promise. God promised that through him, all the nations of the world would be blessed. He gave him the ability to obey, even at the point of sacrificing his own son. And the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 11 that he knew, he was, he was assured that God would even bring Isaac back to life. This is the kind of confidence that is not natural. It's not normal to love God by ourselves. We cannot love God by ourselves. We need Him. So, they leave Ur and they settle in a place that God did not call them to settle. There is a, a parable of Jesus Christ in Matthew 13 uh, about the sore. He sends the seeds, and one of the seeds, they, they fell among the thorns. And they, the seeds, they grew up, and 
the thorns grew up and, and choked the seeds. And Jesus explains that to the disciples, saying that as for what has sown among the thorns, Matthew 13, 22, Jesus says, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The young rich man, he comes to Jesus and says, what can I do to be saved? He thinks that he's, his own deeds can save him. And Jesus says, are you doing the commandments? He says, yes, all of them. And Jesus brings that. Give everything you have. And he leaves. Sad because he was rich. What it means is that he didn't know who he was speaking to. He didn't know the beauty of Christ. The kingdom of God is something, is this precious stone that we're willing to sell everything to pursue it. What is money? What is possessions? We're taught that the more we have, the greater we are, by, by the level of the, the, the ability of acquiring stuff, your value, you're valued in this world. You know, in the kingdom of God, what, how you're valued? Our Lord Jesus Christ was the example. He emptied himself. And he became a man. Living the glorious presence of the Father. He chooses to humiliate himself, to humble himself and become a man and suffer for you and for me. And what the world despises is that, being humble, suffering. We don't have, in many churches, we don't have a theology of suffering, right? It's like Jesus is, is that... Uh, party entertainer that wants to cheer you up all the time. No. He is a suffering king. We are called to respond to the calling of God in the same way. The more we know about this God who saved us, the more in love, the more beautiful he is to us. You need to know God. Please, beloved, don't keep looking elsewhere. Look here. He revealed himself here. We had a, a friend come and visit us for a few weeks, and um, the wife, a family, right? So husband, wife, and two, two kids. The wife looked, um, we were friends back in Brazil for many time, and the wife looked what was our routine every day, what Rebecca did at home and all things, you know. Uh, we have one, uh, one goal every day is to keep the children alive, so we're, we're doing a good job. This is our, our goal. But when she looked at what Rebecca did every day with the kids and teaching and this and this and that, she's like, wow, I, didn't, I, I knew you. You are my friend. I had an appreciation for you. But now that I know what you do every day, my appreciation is much more for you. This is a small thing. But what would our reaction be when we know more about God? It would humble us. It would give a heart of a servant. It would give us piety. It would... We would realize that we need a Savior. We need Him every day. It's not because I'm a Christian for 20 years that I don't need Jesus. I need Him to take the next step in life. And the more we know, the more we hear the gospel every Sunday, the more in love we are with Him. And we want to be near Him because He deserves all the glory. He deserves all the praise. So... God 
in the end, he, he, he doesn't give us a trouble-free life. He gives us himself. And that is enough. That is enough for anything we go through in life. We don't need stuff. We need Jesus. We need him alone. So Christianity, as we conclude here, Christianity is not like an imaginary friend. It's not a fairy tale. It's not something to, to make us feel better. Genesis 1 through 11 is this foundation. The Bible is standing here. The, the, the words, in the beginning, God, they are echoing everywhere we look. In the beginning, God. When you look in creation, when you look in other people. Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaim His hand, handiwork. They are preaching to us. Every time you go out your house, every day you look up, Listen to that sermon and glorify God. As a, I heard a preacher saying the other day, that when we look at God's grace, may, may I never forget the fact that God saved a wretched sinner like me. May I never get over the fact that He allowed me to see another day. May I never get over the fact that He's patient with me, that He's long-suffering with me, and that in me dwells nothing that can satisfy Him. Listen to these words and bring that to your heart. May I never get over being broken over my sin. May I never become complacent. May I never stop realizing the incredible distance between me and my Jesus. Because that's the only way that I can appreciate the distance he traveled to make me his child. He came and he saved us. So, when, when I fear that my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. Your salvation is held not by your deeds. is held by the Christ that conquered death on the cross. So when you're in Him, nothing can remove you out of His hands. So Christ will hold you fast. We will sing that song now. And we'll sing with our hearts and our souls. Christ will hold us fast. Amen? Please, let's stand so we can sing this song.